hypothetical webinar series. We are very grateful that you are able to join us um, to come together for one another to quote one of our esteemed speakers, Karen So. This afternoon, uh, we have um, three beautiful ladies uh, who are doctors in their own rights to share with us um, on breasts, gynecological issues, and um, medical aesthetics. Um, the reason why we organize this uh, webinar series is so that women can come together to learn from each other and empower each other to better look after our health. This being the October, which is also the Breast Cancer Awareness Month, which is a very special month for me because I'm a breast cancer survivor and um, I'm very, very grateful for life and would like to enjoy it together with you. Um, without further ado, I would like to invite uh, our very first speaker, Dr. Bernetta Tan, to share with us. Um, I will put up a screen um, with Bernetta in there. Can you all see Bernetta? Yeah. This is uh, Associate Professor Bernetta Tan. She's a senior consultant and breast surgeon from Singapore General Hospital, um, National Cancer Center, Sinkang General Hospital. I don't know how she divides herself into so many places, but um, she's done a great job. <laughs> so um, Bernetta is from the class of 1987. Um, just a year or two younger than me, and she's from the house uh, from the house Tabot, which is a pretty cool house. So over to you, Benetta. Hi. <clears> Hope <throat> well, everyone can hear me. Sorry, I've got a little bit of a bad throat. <clears throat> so, yeah, bear with me for a little while. Okay. Um, just let me share the slides. That we are... Two. Okay. It's coming. Can you see the slide? Can you see the screen? Can. Hi. So thanks, Jock. Thanks for inviting. And as you said, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, October. So we're all in pink today in support of breast cancer awareness. So uh, it's really nice to be back um, to, to share this. And this is the first series I'm doing for BCAM. And, and it's great to be doing and sharing this with the RGS alumni. And, and I hope there'll be many more to come. Okay. So as we see, we, we do see a lot of uh, women with breast cancer these days and, and there are a lot of things that we hear about and uh, we think about, but we actually do not think enough about it unless until somebody near us uh, is stricken with the condition. So I hope in this particular sharing, we can talk about some of these things that can improve and empower us to allow us to do more for ourselves as well as, 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 well as our loved ones. So the few things I'll cover are things like risks of breast cancer, what we can do about screening and a little bit on about the treatment choices that we have uh, in this day to day. So common questions we, we see right when we talk to women about uh, breast cancer and screening and it's always asked, do I really need to go for screening? You know, and uh, the fear of a particular symptom that we have, be it a lump or a pain, you know, the fear of cancer is so great and some people come forth very early and some people just don't come at all, right? And once they are diagnosed or some even feel that they don't want to be diagnosed because they are very fearful of the treatment that, that can come after the diagnosis and the fear of that harm that come, can come from treatment defer them and deter them from coming forth in an early phase. So just a little bit of what we see from the stats and how things are in Singapore, really. In 2016, Health Promotion Board did a survey and, and we discovered that less than 40% of Singaporean women actually go for cancer screening. And then that to us is kind of a shock, right? Because we are in the first, we are first world, you know, we have educated people in the country and we, we think we know a lot. But when it comes to our own health, we are not coming forth. And that is despite the, on the interview that a lot of the women said that they, they knew that there are benefits of mammogram screening. So then what's the problem? Why are they not coming forth? So again, these are the common reasons that we see. You know, a lot of us are busy in the things that we do, whether it's career or family, there are just too many competing uh, priorities that we have to deal with. And you know, it's just not enough that we know about to make us come forth 
right? Common things that we hear are uh, women who say that I don't have a family history, um, I, I feel healthy, I've got no pain, you know, that therefore I'm, I should be fine, I, I do not need to get uh, a screening done, I wouldn't have breast cancer. The others who are busy and said I have no time or it's too expensive, Something that's very real and is the pain, the discomfort. So there are women who have gone for mammograms or hear from their friends who have gone for mammograms, right? And, and the, the fear of that pain actually deters them from coming forward. And of course, there are those who have done it before and feel that, you know, I've done it once and then the mammograms are fine and therefore I should be fine for the rest of my life. So these are the misinformation that we hope to clear and encourage women to know a little bit more so that they can do more for themselves. So as we know, we, we know that knowledge is power, right? So, so at the end of the day, looking at all these questions that we have asked and we have heard all over the years, do we really know enough about breast cancer and how it really affects us? And do we really want to do something about it? And that's the important question and that's the very important message uh, that we hope to, to share and to pass to our friends and our loved ones. So again, back to the common questions, do I really need to go for screening? Sorry. To answer this question, then really we need to know a little bit of the background, a little bit of the statistics, right? A bit boring, but yes, we need to know how big the problem is. So we know breast cancer is very common. How common is common? It's, it's the most common cancer in women. If you look at that, look at it in terms of numbers, uh, there are more women with breast cancer than women with colorectal cancer. And if you put the number of men and women with colorectal cancer, there are probably more women with breast cancer than those with colorectal cancer with both men and, men and women put together. And in the recent few years, we are seeing like about 2,000 Singaporeans and uh, PRs with breast cancer diagnosed every year. And that number is rising over the decades. And it's an alarming uh, number that we are seeing. And if you look at numbers, you know, by the time we're age 75, we estimate about one in 13 of us will have breast cancer. If you look at it across the age groups, it can affect anyone, really. Uh, this graph on the, on the table here just shows the changes and increase in incidence over the past uh, three, four decades. And it really has tripled in the numbers that we are seeing. So although now the most common age group is in the probably 60s to 70s, clearly we do see women in their 40s and below, and even as young as 30s. And, and because we are a tertiary center, we, so, we do see women in their 20s and early 30s coming to us, although they are the, not the most common. So really it can affect any one of us. So we just need to be a little bit more aware of it. But there's good news to this one, uh, and over the years, we do see improved survival. So over the decades, we are, we are doing better. Our survival rates has gone up, and, and so there are really many women amongst us who are cancer survivors. And we also know from the data and from the specs that the earlier we diagnose, the earlier we treat, the better the outcome. And, and this is the powerful information and powerful message that we, we need to have, because that's the message that we need to drive to get women to come forward to do something for themselves better early than late. So what else do we need to know, right? What are our risks? Some people will say that, you know, I don't have a family history and therefore I don't have any risks. But that is not true again, um, because we know that majority of the women that we see today don't have family history. Right? More than 70 to 80% of women we see don't have any family history at all. And, and these are the, some of the risks that we need to be aware of. Of course, being female alone is already a risk factor for, for having breast cancer and some of things things we can't change, right? Increasing age is, of course, we mentioned about family history that increases our risk of breast cancer, especially if there are familial syndromes. Uh, with a past history of a cancer before or having been diagnosed to have a, what we call a high-risk abnormality in the breast also increases our risk. Um, our hormonal exposure in terms of early menarche, menopause, um, whether we have more children, we have children earlier, whether we breastfeed our children or the use of hormonal therapy all can increase and affect our risk. Then again, uh, last but not least, but lifestyle choices, right? Because a lot of things we do in terms of how we manage our lifestyle, in terms of exercise, how we maintain our weight and whether we drink alcohol or we smoke, all will affect. So some of these risks actually we have no control of. We, we can't change some of these risk factors. Right? We can't change our age. We can't change our sex. We can't change our family. But there are clearly things that we can change. And these are the choices that we, we need to make. We must try our best not to increase those risks, 
And whenever possible, we try to reduce the risks, right? The lifestyle options and life, better lifestyle changes and lifestyle options. And of course, the other thing that we can do is really to really try to take care of ourselves a little bit better and start mammogram screening because the aim is then to pick it up earlier than later. A common question that uh, uh, a patient asked before, and she didn't, she wasn't aware that she was considered an alcoholic, right? Because we were not quite aware of how much alcohol we drink is considered significant. So if you look at it based on what's uh, in the data out there, if, if you do drink on a daily basis, just one glass of wine, it increases your risk of cancer by 5%. Okay, so if an occasional drinker once in a while with family occasions, that's probably fine. But if you do drink on a daily basis, perhaps it's something that uh, we need to change, right? Something that we're not so aware of in the quantum. So we, we do need to pay attention to that. So then what are mammograms and why are they useful? And what can they do for us? So it is really a simple low dose radiation x-ray of the breast. Uh, if you look at the picture out there, what we really do in a mammogram is we really pull out the breast, squish it between two plates and put the x-ray through, right? So yes, it is uncomfortable, uh, but the painful bit can be painful for, one, for some women during that, uh, the compression phase, but it's very short. Uh, it takes about 30 minutes to take two x-rays of each breast and the discomfort and the duration, although it will change with the individual's shape and size and how much effort we need to do to take a good mammogram. So, but all that said, what it aims to do then is to be able to identify a cancer early, right? A lot of times the mammogram is meant to pick up uh, in women who are asymptomatic, that means they don't feel any problem, but it may harbor a cancer that we can see on a mammogram, like this small little nodule that we see on this particular mammogram circle in pink, right? Uh, it was not felt, uh, but it was picked up as an early stage cancer because this lady went for her screening mammogram. Then we all, some of us will have benefits in our work, right? We have got the company insurance, we have got the health benefits from our work, uh, HR. So we have got easy access to uh, healthcare, to our GPs, and then get our mammograms done. But actually Singapore has got a, a national screening program that uh, we should be aware of, and it actually provides a lot of uh, uh, expert uh, screening. So this is basically a program that has been around since 22. 2002, and it's run through Health, uh, health Promotion Board. And uh, it has a lot of subsidies and, and in terms of it being affordable and at different phases, there are a lot of additional help that we can get, whether it's from Cancer Society or otherwise. Uh, but the key important for this program is really the wide accessibility as well as the consultant-based program because a lot of uh, um, uh, Singaporeans were thinking, you know, if I have to go to polyclinic to get my mammograms done, then you know, they may be seen by junior doctors and that therefore it's not good enough. But a lot of us in the institution are part of the National Screening Program and this, this program is run by us and our consultants, uh, consultant base. Uh, this allows the miss rates to be kept as low as it is possible. So we do encourage women to make use of that program if you are, do not have any other uh, sources of access to easy mammograms done. The next fear will come, right? Um, some will not come forth because they felt something because they are fearful of the diagnosis and there, there are those with symptoms that are not uh, due to cancer but are fearful and frightened to death, right, from the, the, the thought of finding something in the breast. So it is important then to be aware of what we need to pay attention to, how do we check ourselves and how do we look out, uh, what do we look out for. So this is just a spectrum of the presentations that the breast cancer can appear. Although we hope that most women will be diagnosed and picked up with a screening mammogram, that actually when there are no symptoms, that means asymptomatic, right? Then the likelihood of the cancer being early uh, is at its best. But by the time a woman, uh, women pre um, kind of present with a symptom, for a lump to be felt, it will probably be about two centimeters. Anything more than that is already a stage two. So the breast lump is the most common uh, symptom that we see in, in women who present right, when they have a diagnosis of breast cancer. But it's it really an array of uh, symptoms uh, ranging from redness, uh, distortion, dimpling of the skin, uh, an ulcer, nipple changes, or even bleeding from the nipple. Right. But the most common really still is when there is a symptom, it's really a painless breast lump and a woman feels perfectly well. 
right? And that, that is also an important notion because the, we, we see women who don't come for many months after noticing their lumps and allow the lump to grow. And the reason is that, you know, they say, I, I don't feel pain and I feel perfectly well. I feel healthy. And then that's why they delay coming forth. So that is also an important concept that, that we need to understand and need to appreciate and then come forth to get ourselves sorted out earlier rather than late. So what should I do then if I discover something? Right. So the, the next step is really to do, go to our family doctor, to our GP or to the polyclinic to let them have a look. And if the, the symptom or the finding is suspicious, right, then clearly they'll get referred to the institutions, uh, to the specialists for further review. So if the patients do come to me at that point in time, then these are the few things that we would do, you know, in terms of uh, assessing clinically with the history, clinical examination to see whether they're suspicious. Look out for other problems if there are, because not all symptoms that uh, present as a breast complaint is truly due to the breast. For example, uh, a very common symptom patients come to my clinic is for breast pain but a lot of the pain is not in the breast the, a lot of the pain is in the muscle behind the breast so it's actually a muscular skeletal pain and that is not a, a big problem but because we don't feel the lump we don't feel the lump and the fear of the pain is so high then you know that that if we do not sort out and get a diagnosis right for the muscular skeletal pain and treat accordingly that that fear never goes away so that clinical assessment is then very very important Right. Then depending on the age group of the lady, then the, the various series of things that we can do in terms of scans, whether it's a mammogram or the ultrasound. And if we do find something that's abnormal, then the biopsy is then required. And if we do uh, see a cancer and we look for spe special characteristics of the cancer in terms of the cancer type, the grade, or the special markers or what we call receptor status, because that will affect how we treat uh, the cancers. Next after the diagnosis, what happens, right? Commonly, thankfully, Singaporean women are very brave. <laughs> Most of our patients take the diagnosis very, very well. And actually, I'm very happy that I'm very glad the majority of our patients do accept and the recommendations and go forth and complete their treatment. But there will be still a lot of fear, a lot of questions, and there will still be some women who will run away. And this is not specific to just ethnicity or age or educational status or how well they are because we have executives that see us in the clinic with very, very advanced breast cancers diagnosed before and refuse to come for treatment. So, so there is something about the information that we need to decipher uh, that need to help be able to help the women who, who, who then do not suffer from uh, a late treatment you know, after having a problem diagnosed. So common questions again, I'm afraid of treatment. Will I lose my breasts? I don't want chemo because it makes me really sick. It will kill my innocent cells. I can't lose my hair. Uh, my family depend on me. If I go for treatment, who's going to look after them? Right. But that's something that we, we again need to take note that if we, if we do not look after ourselves well, then we'll be in no position in the future to look after our loved ones. And, and that's a very, very important message I tell my patients uh, often enough. And I, I hope that this message uh, will stick because especially the young women that come to us, right, they are very reluctant to do the dramatic uh, treatments because they are concerned because they are in a prime of their uh, kind of the age, right? You know, and, and then being struck with a sudden diagnosis like this makes it very, very difficult to accept. And those are the most painful, most painful to see. So then what do we need to know about the advances in treatment care for us to know a little bit more, to be able to appreciate the differences and then to be able to help our friends and loved ones accept and understand uh, the conditions a bit better and then uh, to accept the treatment. Right, so in these days, it's no longer just surgery. In the past, maybe 50 years ago, breast cancer is just surgery and nothing else. And, and that's all we can do. But in this day, it's really a multi-modality, multi-therapy type treatment. And that explains really the, the, the success in the treatment and the improved outcome. So, so we really work as a very, very close team with our medical oncologists and radiation oncologists to provide a very whole, uh, a complete and individualized treatment depending on the tumor stage and the tumor subtype. 
So broadly, since I'm a surgeon, I'll talk about surgery, right? So <laughs> broadly, surgery for breast cancer, in a traditionally, we know it's a mastectomy, meaning removing the whole breast or breast-conserving surgery, meaning we remove the cancer with the border of tissue around it, but we keep the, breast in, the rest of the breast intact. So broadly, these are the two large groups. But actually, in these days, there's a lot of variations in what we can do now in terms of mastectomy as well as breast-conserving surgery. So just a short 10 years ago of what I used to do 10 years ago and what I do now, there are a lot more procedures and variations of the procedures that I do now than I did 10 years ago. So, and 10 years is not a very long period of time. So, so there are really advancements, right? So in the past, mastectomy is the, is the fairly standard. So although in, if you look at it, actually in Singapore, mastectomy is still the most common procedure most breast surgeons do. And, and in Singapore, it's probably about 60% of women will choose a simple mastectomy. But we are changing. We are changing. So if you compare to the West, for example, probably about 70% of women will save their breasts. And if you look at Korea and Japan, they are the same. Right? Breast conserving surgery is the, is the norm, uh, but not in Southeast Asia and where we are. So um, it's perhaps the awareness and the mindset and then with time that is changing. So back on breast conserving surgery, as I said, is something that will try to keep the maintain the breast. So the breast volume is good, tumor is small, there's many there's very uh, there's little change to the breast shape and form, but um, breast conserving surgery does need to have radiotherapy, right? So nowadays, in terms of the arena of the additional types of procedure we do, and you may have heard of oncoplastic breast surgery, which is a whole array of techniques that we have used incorporating plastic surgery techniques to make the breast still look like a breast after we take out the tumour. And, and that's very important because to these days, a lot of our women live for a very, very long time. right? They may forget the chemotherapy, they may forget the radiotherapy, but they will never miss the scar that's on the chest. So they do live a very, very long time with that scar and with the damage that is done if the surgery is not done where they want it to be. So, so we do pay a lot of attention these days in terms of making our best effort to not only remove the cancer completely with good surgical uh, oncological outcomes, we try to preserve a good form so for the lady to live a normal life uh, for as long as it is possible. So these are just some of the techniques that we do, uh, that we do right, in terms of just shipping the, reshipping the breasts. There are techniques we do, for example, in this case, we do a partial flap. You know, in the past, if you have a large enough tumor, we take off the lump, it will cause a big deformity and big, cause a big hole, the breast will go completely out of shape. Nowadays, we have techniques for a partial flap, for example. In this case, in the upper outer quadrant, we can reshape to fill the flap to maintain a normal shape and size. For example, another one is uh, the tumor at the bottom of the breast. If you take it out, it will be a hole in the bottom of the breast. And if I use the tissue at the bottom of the breast to fill it up, you can maintain the normal shape. So these are just some of the interesting things that has evolved over the years. And, and these are the things that we can do for the women out there. What about systemic therapies? I mean, as I mentioned, you know, treatment is not just surgery alone, and, and the success is really with the systemic treatment that our patients receive. And it is a variation, it's a combination of chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is dependent on really the stage of the cancer as well as how aggressive the tumor types. So the the more advanced the stage or the more aggressive the tumor types, then chemotherapy will be recommended because it's proven to be able to reduce the risk of relapse. Tumors that have got hormone receptors, for example, then we give medicines like a blocker to block the hormonal uh, receptors. And of course, uh, tumors with the mutation of the CRP2 gene, then we have the additional therapies that can target this uh, gene mutation that is proven to improve long-term outcome. Radiation, we might, we might also have heard, right? So radiation is basically using low, uh, radiation to so kind of, uh, the way I explain to my patients, it really do like to sterilize the surrounding areas of the chest after we have kept the breast. But it's also given for very advanced cancers, uh, large tumors and large lymph nodes because it is proven also to reduce the, re the relapse uh, in this area. So traditionally, we have what we call external beam radiation where we give the radiation um, after the surgery is done. Right. But we do have other techniques, for example, in, in Cancer Centre, we do have the, in, the intrabeam, which we can give intraoperative radiotherapy. And, and this is actually reserved for a select group of good biology tumours that we can reduce a 15 time to 20 time outpatient post-surgery radiotherapy to a single dose during surgery. So this is some advances that we do have that can make treatment a little bit easier to accept.
And But this has to be really with patients who do not delay and go for screening, pick up the cancers early before they are really suitable. So how do all this uh, barrage of different treatments come together, right? So hearing about the different things is then hard to picture. So I've got two examples of how we can uh, put to play uh, these different modalities of treatment and, and, and see if maybe this will come a little bit clear to, clearer to our audience. And, and really treatment is individualized. So I've got this 75-year-old lady, right, Madam A. She's, uh, she went, she's healthy, uh, minimal comorbids, went for national screening. And then at a screening site, it, we discovered a small little lump, okay, in this. And then she was recalled to the assessment center. And on the ultrasound, we find a small little tumor, less than two centimeters. And then we did a biopsy. And when we did the biopsy, we found that this tumor is what we call a tumor that is ERPR positive. That means it's quite good biology, not so aggressive. And therefore, this tumor is one that's suitable for intraoperative radiotherapy, which is what we offered her and that she accepted. So in, in this case, we did the surgery uh, and in cancer center. We removed the lump. We checked her lymph nodes. The lymph nodes were not affected. And because she she met the criteria for intraoperative radiotherapy. We did the radiotherapy in the 24 minutes during surgery. And uh, that, was, that was it. That was done for her. So after that, she went home on the same day. And when the results came out, margins were all clear. She did not have any other radiotherapy after surgery. And the only treatment she required was five years of uh, letrozole, which is a hormonal therapy. So this is just a good example of how we interplay the, the advances in the technology and, and up to in the treatment care today. So this is a, a scenario that I hope to see often uh, rather than to see a patient with a more advanced condition. Ms. B, another case, uh, a lady, which uh, she's, this lady is about uh, 50. 50. She's uh, uh, well-educated in the uh, prime of her career. She had a lump that uh, she felt for the past six months, right? And it's, it's really enlarging in size. And it took her a while to come forth because she has a lot of other commitments that she couldn't come forward. And when she finally came to the clinic, uh, she's this huge mass in the breast that was about six to seven centimeters. When we did the biopsy, it, it was already a stage three and the tumor was a little bit of the more aggressive type tumor. So we enrolled her into our preoperative program, which is to change her order of our treatment and to have chemotherapy first rather than have surgery up front. So this is another way of how we change treatment, right? Although traditionally we have surgery first, but in certain cases we do have chemotherapy, then the systemic treatment first. So if you see on this, this, this is actually an MRI of her. Uh, and the left side is where you see this white area is where the enlarged tumor was, right? And then uh, after she completed her chemotherapy, a systemic therapy with a targeted therapy, the, the tumor mass was no longer seen on MRI. So, so this also tells us that treatment works. It, it can really respond very, very well. In this case, she had excellent response that we can see in the pre-surgical uh, MRI scan. How did we then plan surgery for her? So she was not keen to lose her breast, right? And she really wanted to try for us to keep her breast. So this is again a variation of techniques that we use. Uh, it's called melon slice because it looks like melon skin on the outside, but it's, it's a way for us to remove the central part of the tumor and then to reshape the breast to maintain the breast form. So the right is just really an X-ray of the specimen that we took out to show that the clip of that marked the center of the tumor was, that was still there and that we have localized it accurately in the surgical uh, uh, exercise. And for her, the response was excellent. The margins were clear. The, there was still a very small residual tumor, but majority of the invasive part of the cancer is no longer uh, found alive on the post-op histology. And post-surgery, she still has the breast form. Um, of course, without the bra, she looks a little different, but with the bra, she still maintains a fair amount of uh, symmetry. And then that, there's an outcome that she was hoping to get, and she managed to get that outcome. So this is, again, something that we always try to do to help to meet the woman's needs, uh, apart from treating the cancer. Of course, there will be some women that would have no choice, right? The, the cancer is just too large or there are multiple cancers in the same breast that the mastectomy, that means the removal of the whole breast is 
becomes a, a necessity. But nowadays, we do have reconstructive options in terms of uh, reconstructing the breast, whether we use our own tissue or whether we use implants or a combination of both techniques are available. And, and we are seeing a, an increase in percentage of women going for breast reconstruction. Right? 20 years ago, we will see probably just about, uh, you know, in, in a year, we'll probably see anywhere less than 20. Now in SGH, we see over 100 cases a year on a yearly basis. So, so the numbers have has risen quite a lot uh, over the years and people are accepting. But also because our plastic surgical te colleagues uh, techniques have improved tremendously and, and they are getting very, very good at it. So it's, it's really great. So moving forward then, we need to think about after all these things, what are the things that we can do, right? If we think about it, there are a lot of things we can do, just whether we will do it. Right, so the, the, the message here is just do it. BCAM, okay, one of the messages we have this BCAM is really to emphasize that the exercise is important. We know that sedentary lifestyle and obesity is a known risk factor for breast cancer. So one of the messages we are striving this year in our BCAM is to really encourage women to exercise. And, and really the message here is just 150 minutes of exercise a week is enough to re reduce our risk. So do join us. We have got this ping pong challenge uh, that, that we can do to raise the awareness as well as raise funds for breast cancer research. Uh, you have seen a couple of these uh, posters throughout the talk, and, and these posters I like very much. These posters were produced by Breast Cancer Foundation quite a few years ago. And, and uh, the, the message for these posters is really, are we obsessed with the right things? We see, you know, we will go to the hairdresser and pay for our hairdo for 200 bucks, but the mammogram is too expensive. We see the pimple in our face, but we refuse to check ourselves for the breast lump, right? We are concerned about the aesthetics and behind and in terms of how we look, but we forget that it's important to look after that as well if we want to maintain the aesthetics for the breast. So this is a very powerful uh, set of uh, posters that I, I still enjoy to use on a regular basis, although it's been a, probably a decade old. Okay, so last but not least, I hope everyone takes care. Uh, please look after ourselves, look after your loved ones, um, support breast cancer awareness. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danita, for such a comprehensive um, sharing on um, breast cancer and the treatment and uh, giving so much hope, you know, to women uh, in general um, to, and to encourage them to go for regular breast screening because indeed um, breast uh, early detection saves life. I found out my, that I had a 1cm lump uh, 10 years ago and um, by God's grace, I'm, I'm okay right now. So um, still around. Um, and you know, I definitely would like to try the pink plank challenge that you brought up. Yeah. Please do, everyone. Thank you. And Breast Cancer Foundation this year, um, mm -hmm. I'm, asked to, I'm requested to do a shout out for them. They are doing a, mm -hmm. a Know Your Boobs Challenge. So mm -hmm. I'll go to their website and, found out, and, and find out more about it. It's, it's quite interesting. Okay. Um, without further ado, um, I would like to invite our next speaker. Um, can you see the slide? I'm going to share screen. Our next speaker, yes, is uh, Dr. Tan Wei Cheng. Uh, Wei Cheng is a senior consultant uh, in health and gynecology at Singapore General Hospital. She's with the class of uh, 1989. She was also the head prefect of that head prefect of that year. But she's quite nice to all of us. Um, she's from the Buckle House, which is also a pretty good house. Um, she'll be speaking on common gynecological issues. Um, I've uh, gone through with her what she's going to share briefly, and uh, it's really amazing. Um, over to you, Wei Ching. Thank you, Joe. Welcome. Thanks, Joe, for the very kind introduction. Um, 20 minutes is really too short to be talking about everything under ONG, so I will be addressing the common issues according to the ages of our, according to the decades of our ages. 
So I'll start off with the 30s and uh, talking a little bit about fertility, screening for Down syndrome for pregnant women, and go on to our 40s, talking about abnormal menstruation. And in our 50s, um, a bit about menopause and uh, hormonal replacement therapy. And eventually, something that is relevant to all of us will be on pap smears, HPV screening, HPV vaccination, as well as cancer screening. Mm -hmm. So in our 30s, uh, where many women are planning um, pregnancy, we would actually advise them to consider, make sure that they are living healthily. And it's easy to start off by telling them not to smoke and making sure that their vaccinations are up to date. And this would include vaccinations like hepatitis as well as uh, even flu vaccinations. So if they have any known um, health conditions, whether it's diabetes, high blood pressure or thyroid disorders, it's probably to get best to get all these conditions under control before they try for a pregnancy. And um, even though Ben talked about um, the alcohol intake, uh, many of us hopefully are not, are not alcoholics or caffeine-holics. Mm -hmm. So I would say that a little bit of um, coffee and uh, your weekly glass when you're out with your friends or your family having dinner is probably fine even when you're pregnant. In terms of um, pre-pregnancy, um, the, uh, the, we see patients who come for tests because they want to make sure that they're healthy before they actually try to get pregnant. I would say that it's probably not, um, not uh, indicated if you're, uh, if you're known to be healthy and you're well. But one thing that we would actually recommend for couples um, if they're planning to get pregnant soon is actually to be seen for thalassemia screening. It's just a simple blood test because it does affect about 3 to 9% of the population in Singapore. And it's a fairly good chance that your partner may also be a carrier like yourself. So if, you do, if you're a carrier and you do marry somebody who is a carrier, then there's a fair chance that your um, offspring will be fully affected. So not a bad idea. Obviously, hopefully by that time, you're not thinking about changing a partner if he is a carrier. But um, if, it's, if there's still time, if there's still time, you, there's, it's always not a bad idea to come for thalassemia screen. And once you start trying for your pregnancy, uh, you can start uh, taking folic acid. This is just a very simple vitamin, vitamin easily available. You don't need to uh, prescription for that. Just pick it up from the pharmacy. And this is primarily to protect the uh, baby's spine from this condition called spina bifida. And uh, the last bit is on subfertility. If the couple has been trying actively for about 12 to 18 months and still not falling pregnant, it is probably not a bad idea to uh, see a doctor, see a gynecologist. And I'm talking about 12 to 18 months of active trying. Not somebody who's lived apart from the partner for the past six months because the partner is working uh, elsewhere. So active trying and um, not pregnant, it is not a bad idea to run some tests uh, for, both, for both the uh, male and the female partners. So once um, the woman is pregnant, uh, there, there's, uh, there are quite a barrage of tests they can consider doing. But for a start, we always offer Down syndrome screening to our pregnant patients. And the test has been around for many years will be the Oscar test. It is a very simple test that involves just doing a scan. And literally, this means neck thickness. In medical terms, we call it nuclear translucency. We're measuring the neck thickness of um, this fetus between about 11 to 14 weeks, just to make sure that it's not overly thick because that has been known to be associated with uh, increased risk for Down syndrome. And this test is fairly accurate at about 85%. Um, in the past 10 years or so, there's been a lot of interest. This is a new kid on the block. We call this a non-invasive prenatal test. It has a very, very high accuracy of about 99%. This is an even simpler test. This is not a scan, it's just a blood test. So we take blood from the mummy and we're looking for the fetal DNA in the mummy's circulation. So with that, we can have a fairly good estimation of the probability of this baby having Down syndrome. In some patients who, have, uh, who are at high risk of Down syndrome for whatever reason, sometimes they are offered um, the invasive test. This is the amniocentesis. It is a test whereby a needle is inserted into the uh, amniotic fluid, uh, the sac around the baby, and fluid is aspirated so that we can send this fluid to the lab for testing. This gives us 100% certainty. It tells us yes or no whether the baby is affected by syndrome, uh, Down syndrome and other syndromes. Um, however, because it is an invasive test, there is a small risk of a miscarriage. We put it at about fairly low at about 0.5%. But this is what we tell patients if they decide to go for this invasive test. Moving on to our 40s, um, we, we do see many patients with heavy, heavy menstruation. About 20% will complain of increased menstrual blood loss. 
and eventually about 5% will see um, a doctor uh, for heavy menstruation every year. Of this, about 20% will eventually go for surgery to remove the womb, known as a hysterectomy. About two-thirds will then be due to uh, very heavy menses. You can see in this picture here that um, one of the commonest causes of heavy menstruation is uterine fibroids. These are the little white blobs here. They don't look very pretty, but they are very, very benign. They are benign muscle tumors of the muscle layers here, and they are not cancerous. So if um, patients are having heavy menstruation because of the presence of fibroids, they are usually easily treated by surgery. Some patients, though, um, are quite used to the amount of blood that they see every time they have a period, and they do not think that they're having a period. And the way they present to us is they feel um, unwell because they are, they are giddy and because of a low blood count. So we do try to get a more objective assessment of um, whether they're losing too much blood. This is called a PET chart. We tell them to score the PET chart according to the amount of blood, uh, according to the, how the PET, this is a standard size PET, not your maxi um, 42 centimeters PET. So a standard 20, 25, 28 centimeter kind of PET. We, tell them, we teach them to score the, um, the amount of blood on the PET. And then based on the number of PETs that they use, you'll be given a final score at the bottom. And 100, a score of more than 100 is, um, can be suggestive of uh, heavy menses. Um, painful menstruation is not uncommon among our teenagers who just started having their period. It tends to happen a few, uh, starts, uh, they tend to feel the pain maybe a few months after their first period, be it 12, 13, 14. And they do um, have the pain that lasts for the first couple of days of their menstruation. They complain of tummy pain and sometimes just backache. And this can be associated with diarrhea, vomiting, just indigestion, a general feel of um, gastrointestinal symptoms. However, if older women start to feel these symptoms for the first time, very painful periods for the first time in their late 30s or their early 40s, then it's probably not a bad idea to seek a medical, uh, to seek a medical opinion because um, this can be associated with um, pathologies like endometriosis. You can see all these red spots that are on the surface of the uterus as well as the ovaries. Um, this is sort of a spillage of blood from the menstrual blood. And over time, these uh, little red spots can develop into a blood cyst. And if it's um, rather large, at about five to six centimeters, we would actually treat it by doing um, keyhole surgery to remove this blood cyst. In our 50s, um, many of us will reach menopause, and it is a time whereby the ovaries completely shut down. And once they shut down, there's no more production of um, estrogen, the hormones. This is a natural process, but it could be a distressing time for many women. They present with hot flushes, night sweats, vagina dryness, painful intercourse. And it's not uncommon that we hear their husbands say that oh, she's in one of her moods again. Okay? And the only way to treat what is missing is literally to replace what is missing. And we have to talk to these patients about hormone replacement therapy. HRT provides not just relief from all these menopause symptoms, but they also prevent bone loss. And by preventing bone loss, they also prevent eventual osteoporosis. There are some uh, newer medications, newer groups of HRT that provides uh, relief from symptoms. They also provide greater effect. They also can, can lead to a greater effect on sex drive and uh, mood. They help to alleviate vagina dryness. And some patients, because of uh, this dryness, they actually have pain when they pass urine. That can be prevented by some of these uh, hormonal treatment. It helps to prevent bone loss. It builds bone mass. And many of these new drugs actually do not stimulate the womb nor the breast tissue. The other group of medications that we consider for patients um, in menopause would be the uh, medications for osteoporosis. So this uh, group of medications, what I call the bone medications, they prevent osteoporosis and they decrease the risk of fracture. All of those, some of them may actually worsen hot flushes. So if the patient is really telling you that she's um, not feeling so good with her, her hot flushes as well as a heat intolerance, then these group of medications may not be suitable. But whatever the case, they're only started if the, um, a specialized bone scan shows that a patient has osteoporosis. So there was a very big study in the 90s um, from the US, and uh, they're trying, trying to show the two sides of both sides of the coin. Obviously, there are some risks with uh, prolonged hormonal treatment. It was quoted in this study that the risk of breast cancer uh, increased from 30 to 38 per 10,000 women. 
and the risk of heart disease increased from 30 to 37, and the risk of stroke from 21 to 29 per 10,000 women. So um, it is not without risk, but if you take numbers the other way, um, 30 per 10,000 women is 0.03%. It increases from 0.03% to 0.038%. So the absolute risk is very low. Okay, and we, on the other side, I mean, when we talk about the other side of the coin, we also cannot forget that HRT has some benefits. Uh, in the same study, they show that in, it decreased the risk of colorectal cancer and also um, the risk of hip fracture in uh, menopausal women. So it is uh, not a bad idea to discuss with uh, the doctor if a uh, woman is to be started on HRT or not. Some of my patients tell me that they will not stop their hormonal replacement treatment because they want to look like this rather than like this. So after 10 years in the 70s, they've, start stop, uh, they've tried stopping for a couple of months. They feel terrible, more like this woman, and they say, no, I want to go back on my HRT. So you've decided to start HRT, um, talk to your doctor and wait a bit the, the risks and the benefits. For some patients who do not have very um, generalized systemic symptoms, they actually only have vaginal dryness or painful intercourse, then one of the things we can talk to them about is to whether they just want to be started on a very simple cream um, just to apply at the affected areas. They don't have to be taking anything orally. So um, I'll move on to the last bit of my lecture on things on symptoms, uh, gynecological issues that can affect all of us. Um, for vagina discharge, fortunately, um, most of it is usually due to common infections. And this can be infections caused by uh, fungal infections, commonly known as thrush. Patients will um, present with some discharge, usually like a cheesy discharge, and um, there can be some, a lot of itching, but this is usually easily treated with antifungal medications. Another common bacteria that uh, we do pick up is bacterial vaginosis. This is also easily treated with oral antibiotics, but they have to see a doctor in order to get these medications. Um, a very small group of vagina discharge may be associated with um, other symptoms, very severe itching, swelling or redness, pain, pain even when passing urine due to the presence of ulcers at its genital areas. So if there's a change in the nature of the discharge, there's blood stain or there's a strong odor, it is uh, probably not a bad idea to seek some medical attention because it can be a very early manifestation of um, sexually transmitted infections, including gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis, genital herpes, as well as genital warts. Um, in terms of gynecological cancers, um, as Ben had alluded to earlier on, breast is all the way up there, number one. And uh, we're standing at um, number four. This is uh, cancer for uh, cancer of the uterus. And this is cancer of the ovary and number five. And way down at the bottom at number 10 is cancer of the cervix. So cancer of the womb, when we talk about womb cancer, we're just referring to the cancer that arises from the lining, of the inner lining of the womb. And this is the fourth commonest cancer in Singapore. Uh, it does not have a pre-cancer stage. However, most patients will present some, with some form of abnormal bleeding. They, they could be presenting with um, a very prolonged bleeding, non-stop bleeding, four weeks, six weeks, that's not their period uh, when they're not menopausal. Or if they're menopausal and they've stopped menses for about 10 years out of the blue in their 60s, they come to us because they've got postmenopausal bleeding. So we'll do the necessary tests and the biopsy to make a, a diagnosis. Fortunately for endometrial cancer, majority, about 70%, um, they can be diagnosed in the early stage, and this enables us to offer early treatment so it has a very high cure rate. Ovarian cancer um, similarly does not have a pre-cancer stage. However, unlike womb cancer, it could be very silent for many months um, before the patient feels unwell. Most of the time, we can make a diagnosis with um, ultrasound, and we're looking for enlarged ovaries. And we can also do a tumor marker, and this is a um, marker called CA125, which can be markedly elevated in some kinds of ovarian cancer. I know that among the patients, the female patients who, whom we see, um, uh, quite a few of them actually will go through a company health screening, and they are given, uh, they, they will go through a pelvic ultrasound as well as run, run a blood test to, uh, for the tumor markers, and they're given a reassurance that everything is okay. Uh, the difficulty, like I said earlier on with, pre, with ovarian cancer, is because there's no pre-cancer stage, having a normal test, uh, normal scan and, uh, and normal uh, tumor markers at this point in time um, is 
probably predictive for maybe the next couple of months. What is going to happen in the next one or two years, nobody can really tell because we cannot catch it early enough since there's no pre-cancer stage. By the time ovarian cancer is diagnosed, unfortunately, majority are in um, stage three. And because of that, uh, the outcome could not be, uh, may not be very good despite uh, surgery as well as chemotherapy. In some of our young cancers with a very strong family history, um, the mom had it, the auntie has it, the older sisters have it, we will actually refer them to the genetics counselor. And some of these patients will be, um, will go through the blood test for this uh, cancer causing gene called the BRCA gene. I think uh, Benita briefly talked about that earlier on as one of the risk factors for breast cancer. This BRCA gene, if you remember, was made famous by Angelina Jolie because she is a carrier of the gene gene. She was tested for that when her mom passed away. And uh, she was found to be a carrier of the gene, um, which puts at high risk for both breast and ovarian cancer. The general population risk for ovarian cancer is at about 1.4%. And for those who carry a gene, it can be can carry this BRCA gene, it can be as high as uh, 39%. In her case, she was given a risk of 50%. So two years after her double mastectomy, she actually underwent surgery to have both ovaries removed, which put her into menopause. All is not doom and gloom. We have done some good work. So cervical cancer is the 10 most common cancer in Singapore because of pap smear screening. We have a national program, and since the introduction of this program um, 40 years ago, uh, the incidence of cervical cancer has dropped dramatically. All of cervical cancers, 100% of cases, are attributed to human papilloma virus, the HPV. And there's many, many, many types, subtypes of HPV, but the cancer-causing ones, number 16 and number 18, they are responsible for causing about 70% of cervical cancers. And number 6 and 11 are responsible for causing the majority of wars. So this is how we can look. This is the surveys of the cervix. This is what we see when we do a pap smear. And this is the cross-section. It's showing the cancer that develops from this part of um, the, the female anatomy. If you remember just now when I talked about womb cancer, it is the inner lining here but the cervix cancer is just at the entry into the womb and it can become very advanced and it spreads locally. So with the National Screening Program, it is recommended that um, screening for, with pap smears for cervical cancer starts uh, any time that uh, the woman starts having sexual intercourse. It should be performed every three years. And uh, because of this ability to do the HPV test nowadays, we do combine both tests. So most women would be offered the pap smear and the HPV test. And if they're both tests are negative, the next time we see them for a test is five years later. Screening can then stop at age 69 after two negative tests. So even before we talk about screening, and that has brought down the incidence of cervical cancer, I think everybody should be made aware that um, we can play a part in cervical cancer prevention, just like we can play a part in breast cancer prevention. Right now, um, there is a HPV vaccine to vaccinate against the viruses that causes cervical cancer. There are three types available in Singapore. Uh, Cervix was the one that was first available and it's, uh, it covers the two viruses, the cancer-causing one, 16 and 18. Gardasil 4 covers four viruses, so it covers the cancer-causing ones as well as the ones that causes uh, genital warts. The latest one is Gardasil 9. It covers nine HPV subtypes, so it provides the highest coverage and it, it is licensed for use in both boys and girls. The dosing is about the same. It's a three-dose schedule for all three vaccines. Um, they take the first dose and two months later, they take the second dose and they complete the third dose by about six months. So since um, uh, early last year, in, in April 1929, uh, MOH has launched a school-based uh, vaccine program um, for our SEC1 female students. Everybody gets a cervix um, vaccination. However, this is an opt-in scheme. So they'll be all invited to um, have vaccination and it is up to them to, for the parents to give consent and for the patients to undergo this, uh, for the girls to undergo this vaccination um, in the schools. Cervix is the one that's been, uh, that's, that's been given to these uh, students because of its efficacy. The main reason why we want to vaccinate them is to pr uh, prevent cervical cancer, also because of um, pricing, health economics, and also because that there's uh, stock available. There's been no reported serious uh, adverse effects with uh, cervix vaccination. Um, some patients may get some pain, swelling, but uh, usually nothing too major. 
So just put up this table for the comparison of cost. I think uh, this is probably quite valid even as today in terms of the pricing. Um, most GPs, private hospitals, institution hospitals, they will offer vaccination for um, all these three um, uh, vac vaccines nowadays. The only one that you cannot use your MediSafe to pay for is uh, Gardasil 9. Hopefully um, that the policymakers will change their mind about that in a few years. I always get asked in um, the uh, more mature women in, in the clinic whether they should have vaccination um, since they come for pap smears. They're hoping that by having a vaccination, they need not have uh, any more further pap smears. It is not painful to have a pap smear, but it's not the most pleasant thing. So they're thinking that if I get my vaccination, hopefully uh, this is my last pap smear today. But um, vaccination in women uh, for cervical cancer using the three, using any of the three uh, vaccines I talked about earlier on is not licensed in Singapore. And it's been deemed that the benefits are limited because of possible exposure in the past. So for as long as one has been sexually active, even if it's 20 years ago, just at one time, there's possible exposure and the, uh, we know that the protection may not be um, what, is, what it is supposed to be. Also, additionally, um, having the vaccine is not a substitute for cervical cancer screening. So, um, so, so Gardasil 4 offers about 70% protection and Gardasil 9 offers as close as 90% protection. So there's still a remaining 10 to 30% that is not um, protected, the vaccines. So it is still prudent um, to go for your regular cervical cancer screening with the pap smears every three years or if you're doing the HPV, every five years. So um, we have made a lot of progress in women's health in the past 50 years or so, but we continue to face challenges. And I'm fully in full agreement with uh, Benito when she says that we do what we can do is to minim minimize risk factors. High BMI has been associated with wound cancer. Smoking has been associated with cervical cancer and osteoporosis. If we can make some simple lifestyle changes to combat all this, it is a start. And uh, obviously there are things that we can do to prevent uh, cervical cancer like having a vaccine. If there's no known risk factors or there's no preventing certain conditions, then we have to keep up to date with our screening like with pap smears or mammograms. And if everything else is not possible, then uh, anyone who is symptomatic, we advise them to seek early medical attention. Oops, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Wei Ching, for such a comprehensive talk and um, indeed um, sharing on um, early screening. Although some cancers are, are only detected uh, at much later stages, but those that we can avoid, um, we should go for screening. Um, and I also like that you brought up what MOE is doing or the Health Promotion Board is doing with regards to the Gardasil vaccination for all students. And um, I think going forward, we could encourage students who are actually going overseas to look into that as well, Weijing. Yeah, we work together on that. Um, the next uh, person I'm going to um, introduce is this very pretty doctor. Um, of course, all the other two doctors are pretty as well. Um, this lady here, her name is Dr. Karen So. I'm trying to put Karen onto my share screen. There we go. She's the founding director of Previa Clinic. Um, she's really into medical aesthetics. She's also a Raffles Scholar. She's from um, class of 1989 and is from a very nice house called Richardson. Um, over to you, Karen. Hello, everyone. Let me just get my screen on. Okay. Let me on my screen. Oh, oh, wait. Uh, Karen is going to share on Fountain of Youth. That's the title of, um, of her sharing, Fountain of Youth. Right. Well, thanks, Jack, for the introduction. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I thought we have a lighter topic after the very serious talks by Wei Ching and by Benita. Uh, just something to lighten the mood and also to enhance the way we look. So um, as Jock introduced me, I'm the director, medical director of Privet Clinic. It's been 10 years since we started the clinic and it's been quite a journey. So um, this is the topic of my talk, it's called Fountain of Youth. And uh, I think what I will try to do is to demystify uh, some of the things that we do at Medical Aesthetics. And of course, uh, later on, we'll be happy to take some questions if you have any. 
Okay, I guess we have to go back to basics. What happens to skin as it ages and why do we have all these changes? So if you look at skin um, quality, as you age from the 30s to 40s and 50s and so on, uh, the thinning of the epidermis, which is the most superficial layer of the skin, uh, will be quite uh, obvious. You will also have reduced fat synthesis, so you will notice some dryness of the skin and uh, the declining levels of hyaluronic acid and collagen, which is part of the connective tissue uh, under the skin, will also cause sagging and reduce water retention. So what does that mean? You can see from here, uh, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, different factors uh, will affect the skin as it ages. But the main thing that happens is that as the collagen uh, remodeling is reduced, you get less of that in the skin. So you'll find that skin will be a little bit dull, lifeless, and that increases uh, with environmental exposure, with UV exposure. So in your 40s and 50s, you may also have some skin sensitivity because uh, as your skin gets dry, the skin barrier component is reduced and your defense against irritants are also significantly reduced. Karen, we can't see your slides, Karen. You can't see? Okay, oh, let me go for a slide. Yeah. Okay, let me sure. try. Okay. Can you see now? No, just the first slide. Oh, I'm, it's not moving. It's any moving. Slides, yeah, to share. Oh, okay. Now, can you see anything? Um, just your first slide, go into your, if it's a PowerPoint presentation, then go into your second slide and click on it and press share. I'm actually already moving on, you know. Oh, okay. Wait, uh, let me try to, that's unusual. Mm -hmm. Can you see now? Um, still can't. Still on the first slide. Mm. How about now? Um, we still can't. Um, okay, I'm at PowerPoint actually. Yes. Are you able to um, PDF it to our group and then we'll try to see on our own what we can share? Um, mm, send it over to your group. Yeah. To our, our learning group. We can we try, to, try to unshare and share again and see whether it works. Yeah. Uh, you stop share and then share again. You click onto your second slide, you try, you come up, second slide, then press um, share. Now, can you see? Um, your first slide. Still no. Still no. See, Karen has a whole team of people. <laughs> she being the boss. Clearly <laughs> as a whole team of people running all these things for her. <laughs> so now when the boss has to do this. Jo, can you see now the, the screen? No, only see your first slide. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, let me try to email that to you. Okay. If uh, you can't email, then just um, send it to our chat group and we'll try to put it up. I'll try to add. Okay, I'll just send it to you, Jock. Try and see whether you can get it. Okay. Meanwhile, while we're sorting this out, um, if any of the uh, participants have any questions uh, for our panelists, please free, feel free. Um, if not, then perhaps I could um, ask uh, 
asked Benita a question that was sent out to, sent to us um, by our uh, by the uh, the pre registrants the register the people who registered earlier and they have sent some questions over. It's a Saturday afternoon. Ben, I sent those questions to you, right? Uh, yes. Just let me pull it out. Pull them up. So I'll I'll work on uh, Karen's slide. Okay, so just back to the questions that were asked. Let me. Okay, I think one of the first questions that were on the list were what are the common causes for breast cancer and cervical cancer? I think I think Wei Ching also mentioned and discussed uh, the causes of a cervical cancer. Um, for breast cancer wise, I think um, they're, they're probably believed to be multifactorial in the sense that is there one particular factor that's the main cause? Probably there isn't, but a, a combination. We know for sure of, um, genetic mutations, like we say Angelina Jolie with the BRCA gene, that, that's a known high risk factor. But in the terms of uh, the other factors that are listed in the slides earlier, some of the other things that are associated with an increased risk. But if you look at overall, actually, if you go, if I show back the, uh, the slides earlier, there are a few things that are known to be risk factors, apart from family history and genetic mutations, uh, alcohol, obesity, especially menopause, uh, sedentary lifestyle, that means lack of exercise, uh, actually known factors that are, uh, are you know, not just risk factors, but also risk factors that we can modify. So, um, you know, so in, in my talk, I just divided it a little bit in terms of what we can do to make a difference versus those factors that, you know, we are born with that we can't change. So that's also important to appreciate. Right. And uh, next, uh, one of the questions that were asked also related to risk was whether uh, women who breastfed their babies were less prone. So this is also proven, this is also shown. Uh, women who breastfeed for more than six months do get a reduced risk. But a reduced risk or a decreased risk is not no risk lah, because uh, you can still get breast cancer, but the risk might have been reduced because of the breastfeeding in the past. So it's, it's not a, a guarantee that if you breastfeed, you don't have to look after yourself. So, so that message also has to hold. It's, it's not so clear that way. Yeah. You ready with the slides? Or you want, I... Thank you very much, uh, Ben. Yeah. In that question. I have received a Karen slide and I will try to share it right now on my screen. Um, yeah, here we go. Karen, is this what you want? Yep, yep, that's the one. So I will control from here, yeah? Okay, uh, just say next so that we can move on. Okay, where's my slide? So this one, Fountain of Youth. Okay. And we have moved on a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No worries. Please re rewind. It's okay. Rewind. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we can. All right. So we were talking about what happens to skin as it ages. So we can see on this graph that as you get older, uh, there are some changes uh, from skin downwards to the bone, there's bone resorption, there's fat loss, there's fat movement, but also mainly that the skin, the epidermis becomes thinner uh, due to reduced collagen synthesis and due to accumulated environmental stresses. So there's uh, reduced uh, lipid synthesis, there's also declining levels of uh, hyaluronic acid, which holds water, it's like a water reservoir, and also the collagen remodeling uh, is reduced as we age. Next. Yeah, so this is a simplified diagram of uh, our skin as it changes with age. In our 20s and 30s, um, when we are exposed, uh, if we're unprotected uh, to UV damage or environmental stress, uh, there's a lot of free radical damage. These are all unstable radicals in the environment that uh, degenerate the, or attack the collagen structure of the skin. So as we age in 
the 30s, 40s, and 50s, uh, you'll find that skin becomes more and more dull. It loses elasticity. And with accumulated photo damage, you will also inc uh, notice increased pigmentation. Uh, it's also important to notice as we get older, it's important to maintain moisture because moisture is a very important part of the skin barrier. And if your skin barrier is compromised, then you will have more and more instances of skin sensitivity. So there are very various different factors that causes our skin to age. Um, one is the natural aging of the skin. Uh, the other is environmental factors, and uh, some is attributed to lifestyle. And definitely, there's also genetics. Yeah. So uh, go on. So as uh, these are all natural aging uh, uh, process. So as you get older, you can see that the face shape changes. Uh, you will see on this slide that uh, the UV radiation has a significant uh, effect on the skin texture. Uh, okay, next job, thanks. Yeah, you can see that the skin laxity is there. There are fine wrinkles. Uh, just back one slide, please, from job. Yeah, uh, the tone is dull. The texture is also rough. Skin is thin. There's also lots of volume and. Um, that visually cues us to an older skin versus a uh, younger skin. And this is also some of the problems that we face in the clinic that we try to reverse some of these damages or to prevent them from becoming worse. Next. One of the things that uh, not many people know when you apply sunblock is that we always guard against UVA and UVB. But uh, more and more, there's also uh, blue light. So if you're on devices a lot, if you're under uh, fluorescent light, or even in natural sunlight, there is blue light. And that's something that we need to protect against. And studies have shown that uh, lack of protection against blue light uh, also causes accelerated skin aging. Next job. Yes. And one of the things that uh, sometimes uh, we've been asked a lot on the, by our patients uh, is when we have the haze, does it affect uh, our skin? So actually the answer is yes, uh, there are micro particles in the air. And uh, we also know that if patients are living in clean cities like Singapore or in very polluted cities like uh, some parts of Indonesia or in China, that skin aging is accelerated uh, when there is pollution. And these particles do get under the skin. And remember what we said about free radicals, they start to damage cells and then impair healing and cause accelerated aging. So some of the simple things that we can do to prevent UV and environmental damage, uh, one is of course to avoid sun when possible. The hours to avoid are usually from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. where the sun is the most intense and the strongest. Uh, failing that, or even when you're at home, please apply a sunblock. Use a good one with SPF at least 30, UVA protection at three pluses. And if you can find a sunblock with blue light protection, please use that as well. And one point about sunblock is you have to use an adequate amount. Uh, it should be something that is compatible with your lifestyle and your skin type. So for example, if you have very greasy skin, you might want to look for a sunblock that is of a dry touch or of more liquid nature, so it doesn't clog your pores. Skincare is also very important and patients always ask me, so what do I need in my skincare? Uh, of course, it changes as you get older, but a few things are very important to incorporate into your skincare routine. Uh, you need a good cleanser. If you use some makeup, uh, you need an oil-based cleanser and then a water-based cleanser. Uh, you will need a topical antioxidant and typically we prescribe a vitamin C serum or ID Benone. Uh, there are of course newer products in the market, but antioxidants prevent free radical damage. Mm. And so it's a layer of protection against environmental pollution and UV uh, damage. Some of us also take a lot of oral antioxidants, and this is just to supplement the diet uh, if you are not eating as uh, cleanly or as uh, nutritionally uh, complete as you should. High dose vitamin C, uh, some, uh, how do you say? Mm, there are other antioxidants that are in the market, for example, crystallized tomato extracts uh, have been used and have been studied to show 
to protect against environmental damage. Topical creams, uh, we also use uh, as a layer of protection. Uh, these are also uh, a good barrier to prevent the free radicals from entering the skin and to protect uh, against water loss. Next. Okay, then we go to lifestyle factors. Uh, as both Wei Ching and Ben Mita have said, uh, lifestyle is a very important part of health. It is also a very important part of uh, skin health. Regular exercise, uh, drinking enough water will hydrate the skin from within. Nutrition, getting antioxidant-rich food, adequate lipid content in our diet, uh, adequate uh, pycogenols or um, what we uh, protein uh, will help with the collagen synthesis. And a common question is, does collagen supplement, uh, do collagen supplements work? And surprisingly, the answer is yes. Uh, there, there are some signs to suggest that supplementing collagen does improve collagen levels in the skin. Uh, adequate sleep will help to uh, repair skin damage. And of course, as we spoke about supplements earlier, is, is to supplement uh, a nutritionally deficient diet. Next. So here we are, just to show you the effect of uh, UV and environmental damage, uh, these are twins. So same age, same genetic makeup, but uh, twin B happens to like the sun a lot. So you can see on uh, twin B that the skin texture, the lines, uh, skin sagging is significantly worse than twin A who does not like the sun. So it's just to compare uh, the effects of overexposure and photo damage. And uh, so the question is, uh, if you look at medical aesthetics, there's a whole uh, plethora of uh, options available. Uh, and what we are going to do now is perhaps to just explain how some of these work. It's not really, but it's just to demystify some of these modes of action. Next, please, John. Okay, so uh, one of the most common questions is uh, fillers. What are fillers and what do they do? So fillers are products that have been uh, proven safe to be injected under the skin to replace volume loss. And where can we use them? We can use them on eyebrows, on hollows of the temples, to increase volume in cheeks, especially due to age-related changes. Uh, we've done ear look shaping with fillers. Uh, we've defined jaw lines, uh, reduced uh, laugh lines, and also lip enhancing. These are all used by fillers. Typically now we don't use uh, anything that is permanent. Uh, we use a hyaluronic acid filler and these typically last about one year to two years. Uh, most of the time we don't uh, encourage something permanent because there's risk of granuloma or infection uh, in all these uh, semi-permanent fillers. And as you can see, this is a lady who's undergone filler injection and she's had it done on the brows, on the tear trough, which is just under the eye. So what we commonly call the eye bags. And then the marionette lines, which is around the mouth area. And you can see that because of the volume loss and that has been corrected, she looks a little bit younger, a little bit less, uh, more rested. Next. And for younger patients who come to us, uh, a lot of them is not about anti-aging, but they are about beautifying. So typically in our population, our nose bridges are very flat. It's a, it's a Chinese nose or an Asian nose. And uh, fillers injected onto the bridge offers a temporary non-surgical rhinoplasty. So you can have like a nose drop that is non-surgical. It lasts about again, one year to two years. And most patients are happy with that because then they don't have the surgical risk of uh, doing a nose implant. And again, on beautifying a certain proportions of the skin or of the face that is not ideal, you can enhance it. So this is a chin augmentation with fillers. Uh, this lady also had some lips uh, augmented to enhance the lip shape. Next. And then 
Um, also, there's a lot of mystifying uh, mistake around the, the use of the word Botox. Uh, a lot of them consider it a toxin. Uh, that's true. Uh, what, how Botox does it is it inhibits the signals from the nerve to the muscles. And these are the areas that we use to treat, like forehead lines, frown lines, crow's feet around the jawline to make uh, muscles that cause the uh, squaring of the jaw. Next, I'll show you some uh, before and other, uh, after photos. Next, please, John. Okay, so this is how Botox works. Uh, one slide before. Okay, Botox works when you inject around the muscles that cause the contraction and therefore the lines. So if you see uh, that Botox inhibits the neurotransmitter from the nerve endings to the muscles. So there's no way that the muscles can contract because the signal has been blocked. Next one. So typically, you can see the relaxation of the lines around the eyes and around the frown line. Next. And Botox works all the time. It's a guaranteed work. Okay, next. And this is what I mentioned about square jaw, um, the shaping of the face. Yeah, one slide back. Yeah, thanks. Uh, a lot of the Asian ladies like a V-shaped face or el almond-shaped face. And to achieve that non-surgically, we inject into the masseter muscle, a uh, relatively high dose of Botox. And with continued paralysis, there's some remodeling of the bone and a changing of the face shape. So this, the after photo is considered a prettier face shape than the one before because it looks masculine and strong. So a little bit on what's new in the market uh, for aesthetics. Next. Uh, recently, HSA has approved this uh, product called Profilo. It's uh, basically a remodeled hyaluronic acid. And what it does is to hydrate and stimulate collagen to repair sagging tissues and also to plumb up uh, the skin. So remember, as we age, the, the skin thickness uh, reduces. So this product has been approved and proven to uh, increase skin thickness and therefore the fine lines and the papery texture of the skin. Next. And this is injected under the skin at five points and it spreads throughout. Uh, to stimulate that collagen. Right. You can see some of these before and after effects. If you see that the one below, for example, is uh, what we typically associate with uh, older ladies uh, with very, very thin skin. So after two treatments, uh, these results should last about one year. Next. And uh, now we come to a common problem. We have to talk about pigmentation in Singapore because of the UV damage. So skin pigmentation refers to the darkening of the skin uh, because of the excessive uh, production of melanin. And it's usually caused by uh, unprotected or not adequately protected sun exposure. So you have different types of pigmentation, age spots, sun spots, uh, freckles, melasmas and uh, different ways to treat them. So we have options of uh, topical cream, chemical peels, lasers, uh, even uh, injectables uh, I have been used for pigmentation. Next. And uh, one of the uh, lasers that we use quite frequently for pigmentation is this uh, laser called PicoSure. Uh, usually it does this, it puts the laser energy onto the pigment to break it up to enable the body to get rid of the pigmentation naturally. Next. So as you can see from this video, it targets the melanin, breaks it up. And because of the heat, it will stimulate collagen and improve the skin texture. Okay, next. So these are some of the results for pigmentation treatment. Uh, how many sessions and how far apart, it really depends on what kind of pigmentation the patient comes in. Sometimes you, all you require is one or two treatments. Sometimes it's a really prolonged process, especially in the case of melasma. Next. And this is freckles. Freckles uh, typically occur in very, very young 
people, uh, some of it is genetic, but uh, with the lasers, it's quite easy to remove them. And uh, this patient took about two sessions to remove all the pigmentation on the face. Next. Uh, one of the most popular treatments in, uh, in aesthetics is uh, the improvement of skin tone or the reduction of skin sagging. So uh, our therapy is an FDA cleared uh, device to using microfocus ultrasound to create heat spots under the skin to stimulate collagen and to tighten skin. Next. So I'm not sure if you can play the video. Uh, Jock, can you try? Does it work? Okay, but uh, these are the results that we typically see. Okay. So in young patients as well as old, uh, just uh, one before, yeah, that's great. So in younger patients, what we see is that there's a clearer de definition of the jawline, uh, the and double chin area is improved uh, because the laxity there is improved. Can you go back one more? In older ones, uh, you can also see that the pre jaw sulc, which is the saggy uh, part of the skin just behind the mouth area, uh, that will be also tightened using our therapy. Next. And more and more, uh, we find that this treatment is popular because of the uh, social media exposure. Uh, younger people are using it for prevention of uh, skin laxity, and older people are using it for correction. Next. So uh, because it's non-invasive and it's a yearly treatment, so it's quite well accepted by uh, a lot of ladies nowadays. Next. So this is uh, one of the media personalities that came and he liked the results of his treatment. Next. And another popular treatment that we also do quite a bit of in the clinic is the match. The match is radio frequency, uh, radio frequency, also done once a year. And what it does is it heats up the tissues again under the skin using radio frequency radiation and stimulates collagen and causing uh, skin tightening. Next. And you can see that the skin on top of the eye, which is a uh, the eyelid skin, uh, because of the papery texture, will start to droop as you age. Uh, one month post treatment for the match, you can see significant tightening of the upper eyelid drooping. And these are some typical results for the match. Remember, this is non invasive, so there's no uh, injections and no surgery involved in this. It's just basically using heat or, uh, to stimulate collagen and therefore tightening of the skin. Next. And sometimes we do both at the same time. Next. Yeah, so a typical result is like this. Uh, if you see sagging around the jawline, around the cheek area, uh, when you tighten it, you, it does give a more lifted appearance and a little bit younger profile. Next. And so that's the end of my talk. So remember that the skin is our largest, uh, is the body's largest organ. So take care of it and look good. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Karen, for a, a lovely talk. And uh, it certainly gives us a lot of hope, you know, and thanks to medical science. Um, you know, from our early two speakers, we learned that we can actually live longer with uh, right treatment, um, you know, and early detection. And with our third speaker, Karen, we are able to look good while living longer. So um, I'm just very grateful for the sharing. And, uh, you know, as, as you were talking, Karen, I went like, wow, I want that. I want that. <laughs> I want this. That's really good. Thank you. Um, so um, right now, um, the floor is open to Q&A. Um, there are the other questions that have come in, um, but maybe we can deal with the one on hormones. Um, Benita?
Okay, look, yep, I'm looking. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Are you all right? Yeah, I'm just a little bit of a sore throat. Um, okay, so actually, Hui Ching mentioned this one on ladies on, on hormonal replacement. I, I mean, um, hormonal replacement is known as a risk factor. Of course, the odds and the absolute risk may not be very, very high, but it, it is known to be a risk factor. So so from, um, from breast cancer point of view versus uh, the need to manage the menopausal symptoms, especially during transition phase, you know, it's really a balance because we do see women who really battle in the perimenopausal phase and, you know, the life can't go on and therefore you need to really tie them over in this period of time. But uh, it's always balanced with the duration that you need it for versus the odds uh, uh, in terms of the risk of uh, developing breast cancer. So if, if one has got a personal risk that's higher in terms of like your family history or has known to have a high risk uh, breast biopsy change, like an atypical change where the risks are a little bit higher, then generally we will caution to use only when really needed because you are really balancing what you are you are choosing right it's a choice right in terms of what you want to uh, have as a as a, a com competing odds so across the board from 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 cancer point of view then it's yes you know if you need to use it do use it but use it for only the duration you really need it for as a as a general guide how does one know um, when to stop so there are two two groups, right, of patients. I'm gonna be three. There are the women. There are women who don't realize they are undergoing menopause and they sail through it with no problems, right? Then there will be the group that the re really are very symptomatic. You know, they have hot flushes. They can't sleep. They are irritable all the time, and and you know you touch them and they'll flare up. You know, so so but they they in, in the sense of some going to psychosis, and so they really need that hormonal replacement to tie them through that fluctuations. And and it's really how long you can take it for and you can see whether you can tail off and manage the symptoms and stop we find that you are managing all right and then of course the other one is the, the patient the, the lady that Wei Jing mentioned right on the HRT for 10 years and looking good at 10 years and at 70 and still wanting to carry on so those are again choices right so um, it's, it's really at the end of the day it's personal risk versus how we can manage and what we want to achieve lah. yeah yeah, it's like what you mentioned, you know, health mm. is a personal choice, right? And yeah, largely, yes. And yeah, we have control over it and we're encouraging everyone here mm. to really take um, personal decisions and empowering yeah. ourselves to look ourselves, mm. look at ourselves better. Another question yeah. was, are mothers who have breastfed their babies before mm. less prone to breast cancer? Yeah, so so that I yes, so women who have breastfed for at least six months are known to have less or reduced risk. Uh, so then uh, we, we do encourage women who can, you know, with babies and have children to encourage them to breastfeed, but not just for really the breast cancer risk per se, right? Because we know the benefits of the breast milk as well as the closeness of the interaction with the mother. So there are the, a lot more benefits than just breast cancer alone. But for breast cancer, yes, it, it does. It's, it's shown to decrease the risk. But it's not, uh, it's not, a, it's not 100%. It's not protective in the sense that uh, it doesn't mean that if you breastfeed, you'll never get breast cancer. Mm. Thank you. Um, then there's another question that says, besides breast cancer, what other high probability health issues um, affect women? I think uh, Wei Jing has um, mm. mentioned, you know, about um, cervical, uterine, ovarian cancer. Um, what other high probability cancers are there? Um, we can touch briefly on that and mm. we will carry on with the other webinar series on that as well. Yeah, so um, actually apart from breast cancer, the next ones that come along, uh, you know, the next most common is actually colorectal. So the cancers that we show, that we see, it's uh, apart from breast, the next is colorectal, lung, before you come to the gynae related. So actually the next most common is colon, right, mm. before lung. Mm. So these are the things that uh, in, in this day and age, being, uh, you know, first world country, colorectal cancers are common. But unfortunately, can, breast cancer is twice as common compared to colon for women still. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, it also gives um, food for thought. And with that reflection, we probably will look into how diet, you know, could help us, um, you know, uh, cope with mm -hmm. some, of the, um, some of the factors 
um, mm -hmm. that might lead to uh, this sort of um, diseases uh, yeah. in, in the near future. And so mm -hmm. there's a lot of scope for our future webinars in, in that sense. Um, I'd like to take a little break here to um, yeah. um, do a shout out for Professor Chung Seo Bi. Um, <laughs> He, she, she's uh, your tutor. Do not be afraid. I asked her if she has any questions for you. Um, and I asked her to be kind. So she said, no, no questions for now. So I said, your sister <laughs> has some questions. Here's a question, Josh. The webinar. Yes, Jo, she has a question. Oh, she has a question. Yeah, she says, what is the risk of scarring with these treatments in people prone to keloids? That's oh. Karen. Oh, for Karen. Oh, Karen. <laughs> Thanks, Prof. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, I think uh, uh, the main thing for the treatments that we explained just now, most of it is non-invasive. So if we're talking about our therapy or the match, uh, there is actually no risk of keloids because there's no uh, skin break. Uh, if you're talking about uh, Botox or filler injections, the needles used are very, very small, 30 gauge, 32 gauge or 27 at best. So uh, minimal risk. Yeah. Uh, prof? Uh, Prof Chung, does that answer your question? Is that five star? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Karen, good student, right? <laughs> um, one of the questions that come in also from Shu Ying, uh, Shu Ying was our treasurer in our um, exco. Uh, what would, um, two, two excos ago, um, she's now an auditor. So her question is, what would consider adequate lipid in diet? Yeah, so I didn't have much time to elaborate on that uh, earlier, but actually there have been no studies on what's the magic number that you need to take. But I would say a healthy level 20 to 30% of your calories from fat would be good. The other thing is <clears throat> what kind of fat uh, you should take. Uh, not all fats are good fats, of course. Uh, the omega-3 is omega-6. And there's been a study that uh, regular ingestion of evening primrose oil does help reduce uh, dehydration in the skin. So uh, especially it's got atopic dermatitis, uh, EPO. Uh, I can't quite remember the dose, but it does help uh, with the itchiness, the symptoms, the redness of dry skin. Mm. So the take home message is eat healthy fats, uh, eat adequately uh, a balanced diet. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, thanks Karen. <clears throat> Sorry. I can also see a rush, a spike in the demand for primrose. Uh, primrose <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, uh, Prof says uh, you've answered the question adequately uh, in the web, in the chat group. So that's pretty cool. Um, well, um, we've come to the end of um, our webinar. I want to give uh, a very big round of applause and I hope all of you can join me to give a big round of applause to our um, speakers. If you could put your reaction for our speakers. Yay. Right. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Good job, guys. Thank you. Good job, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. And um, at the same time, uh, we we I'd uh, just like to uh, reiterate again that we'll continue with our series of um, of our medical talks um, and um, using our um, getting our reflection doctors. Um, who are so kind to do this community service, both for our alumni, our students, our parents, as well as the community. And we hope you enjoy our time together with the Repletion family. At this point in time, I also like to mention that uh, boss Karen So, uh, who runs a <laughs> clinic, has kindly you know, um, agreed to um, donate um, vouchers uh, for all the attendees here. Um, we will email the e-vouchers to you so that uh, you can visit her clinic and um, come out a different person um, drinking from her fountain of youth. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> yes, thank you, Karen. And um, thank you so much again, um, dear Benetta, Beijing and uh, Karen. Um, thank you ladies for spending the time together with us. Look out for our announcement of our next webinar on our Facebook Oh yes, before I forget, I'm sorry. Uh, Prof Chong, uh, who's also the president of the Singapore Osteoporosis uh, Society, has approached me uh, to uh, collaborate to do a, another medical uh, webinar series on bone health and um, also uh, hormonal health. 
I'll be asking our others, um, you know, other people from uh, Raffles family to speak as well. So we can look forward to that. So take care, ladies, um, and happy Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Go for a screening. Okay, take care. See you soon. Speaker.